so in subsequent weeks mike um i know other people are listening so i thought they might be interested too um i thought we could just have a chat about something obviously let people know in advance yeah um and discuss it from our clinical perspective and then just bring in a couple of pieces of research or something that we're aware of or that we yeah definitely yeah yeah um and just talk talk through that so there's probably a whole host of stuff that we could go through yeah um and it could be quite varied we could either just do things that you know spring up for you or myself in teaching or in clinic yeah. or maybe people might want to suggest topics as well which are quite topical um that we can go through uh if yeah see how you get on see what you no, think it sounds good yeah it sounds really good yeah i think um i mean the uh the kind of clinic clinic that i run has got uh um various different people working in it so we've got about a, a team of 10 and um we uh uh, very much based around exercise as the um, as the main thing that we do, and uh, it would be interesting to talk through the kind of different um, perspectives of um, but coming from it because everyone thinks an osteopath does a certain type of thing, and uh, uh, and I, I think I'm not your um, typical um, osteo. Very few osteopathic clinics have got a gym, um, so it'd be uh, be good to talk through our kind of philosophy here. Mm. Um, and how we integrate everybody. Um, yeah. So Rebecca's just uh, put in. Uh, I'm struggling with what tests to do in general. Uh, could spend all day testing. Uh, tricky to streamline. Okay. <laughs> uh, what kind of uh, tests um, do you mean? Is it for uh, clinical testing or um, special tests that that kind of thing or biomechanical tests? If you give us a bit of a, a bit of a pointer, and then we might be able to help you out there, Rebecca no problem mm, it's a good question yeah there are so many different tests you can do for any chosen area of the body and get Definitely, caught up yeah. doing tons of tests we could do uh maybe a, a session on sensitivity and spe uh, specificity uh validity reliability that kind of thing it's yeah kind of, uh, it's one of those things that's a um, bit of a boring subject at uni <laughs> but uh uh something that is uh you find is is absolutely vital when you when you come out uh okay special test mainly rebecca is saying so cool yeah definitely um we could certainly have a look at that i've been doing um a few webinars recently uh where over the last three weeks where we've gone through uh, cl uh, clinical reasoning. So uh, working through uh, case histories and then sifting through all the information to try and figure out what to do with people and, and whether to do our own testing or whether we just need to refer those people on. And they're, um, they're OSCE exams. So uh, most of the people need referrals, to be honest, um, on those kind of exams. But um, yeah, it's been, it's been a really good uh, good process. Uh, to go through and uh, mm. just uh, especially if people haven't done that before with their um, sort of sports massage sports therapy training I think it's um, uh, especially on the sports massage courses from having taught those before I know it's definitely not um, part of that uh, criteria so it's uh, useful to come from it from a clinician's point of view I think yeah definitely. yeah yeah definitely definitely um, cool well uh, what, what are the OSCE tests so we do, um, you basically get a case history and, um, and then, uh, the way that I've been running it is, uh, go through the case history on the first day and then leave it with people. And, um, so that they then, uh, just highlight the, the key points from the case history. And then we work out, well, why is that a key point? What, why is it, um, led you to kind of, um, uh, think about it and, uh, what could it possibly be? What what would your differentials be? And then working out a justification for those differentials. And then on the Friday session, um, okay, what what was the case pointing towards? Why was it more likely to be that and not and not something else? So it's um, what's OSCE uh, though? OSCE does that, oh, does that uh, um, objective structured clinical exam? Oh, okay. Yeah, so uh, yeah, yeah we, um, well, the way that it used to run it. Um, at the uni was uh, four rooms and uh, so you'd have your case history in the first room and then you'd have to work out what you were going to test for the second room and then what your differentials were for the third room and then your final summary room so it was um it was pretty nerve-wracking we had to do it in an hour and uh, we're doing it over a week so it's uh, it's a bit of a gentle introduction to that yeah. that yeah. horrific exam yeah oh, wow. <laughs> yeah 
Um, I think we're ready to go, Dan. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Um, thanks for joining us again, mate. Um, so uh, we've got some uh, got some sound this week, which is really good. I managed to get everything working. Uh, we've got um, we've got a presentation that uh, Dan started last week. So hopefully those uh, those of you that are joining us tonight um, saw uh, the uh, saw the YouTube video that we put online of uh of the session that we did but dan do you mind just giving us a bit of um a uh, bit of a summary of what you covered last week is that okay oh gosh yeah now you're asking if we can remember <laughs> so it was based on a um based on a summary talk that i delivered in in birmingham at uh, therapy expo last year and it's looking at the core concepts of tendinopathy management and the last week uh, amongst getting our sound somewhat sorted we were talking about the risk factors for tendinopathy there's a wealth of research papers out there looking at different tendinopathies of the lower limb and identifying risk factors everything from gender to um, age to uh, medications etc but mm -hmm. the key thing with the risk factors is to look at the ones which you can modify so if you know that tendinopathy is um, more common in uh, say younger female runners for example then that's really not very helpful because if somebody's a female it doesn't help if you say ah well you know it's it's because um, so we need to take the the risk factors that we can that we can modify and that's mm -hmm. what we were talking about last time and one of the most obvious risk factors is loading so we mm -hmm. can easily modify people's load and we talked about that last time and you have to do that in order to get a successful rehab, rehab program underway the other thing that we talked about was the um, uh, positioning of the person the positioning of the joint because if you put certain tendons in certain positions you create some compression mm -hmm. so this is different than when you stretch a tendon um, which you know um, is fine but if you stretch it too much uh, then it can be irritated such as too much running or too much jumping for example but also the compression of the tendon is a different thing mm -hmm. sometimes if you uh, dorsiflex an ankle too much and there's an irritated tendon there or if you dorsiflex it too much doing some kind of unusual routine action then that might cause a tendon a tendinopathy mm -hmm. uh, I suppose one of the most classic ones is the upper hamstring tendinopathy because when you bend fully at the hip you can compress the upper hamstring on the ischial tuberosities so when you sit down and when you sit on your ischial tuberosities when you when you sit on your bum bones you are effectively also sitting on the upper hamstring tendon mm -hmm. insertion points and that's why sitting or a dull ache when you're sitting can be one of the classic signs of uh, a hamstring irritation yeah now when we spoke um a bit earlier today mike you were saying about the anatomy and how tendons are obviously different well, i mean when you take the patella tendon that doesn't seem to suffer from compression because if you think about where the patella tendon is going from you know from the kneecap down to the top of the shin uh there's no reason for it to be compressed Mm -hmm. um, during any kind of normal motion so that doesn't appear to be to suffer so much from a, a compression um, mechanism unless of course you're kneeling on your knees and there's an irritated tendon there already uh, mm -hmm. but but it, but it does at the hamstring and the other classic one of course is the lateral hip the gluteal mm -hmm. tendinopathy compression can occur there simply by lying on it so lying on on your side at night is a classic irritating factor but also if you stand with your weight on one leg mm -hmm. and let your body bow out to the side as you would if you were like standing just waiting and resting on one leg passively resting on one leg holding a child on your hip that kind of thing then yeah. that can be a classic uh compression factor for the the lateral hip as the itb is compressing over the gluteus medius tendon as well mm -hmm. so when it comes to tendinopathy exercises and risk factors you've got to remove or manage the ones that you can manage and that includes changing their loading but mm -hmm. also activity modification 
So sitting on a softer cushion, not doing exercises with excessive hip flexion for the hamstring, for example, it includes um, perhaps not doing so much dorsiflexion through the ankle and thinking about footwear choices to try and modify that. Yeah. And for the for the um, Achilles and for the gluteal, it involves changing uh, resting position at night and um, also avoiding that hanging on the hip or sitting cross-legged those those mm -hmm. uh, those types of things as well um so yeah those compression factors if you don't knock those on the head if you don't identify those and manage those mm -hmm. then you might be sort of fighting the battle with one hand behind your back because i mean particularly for gluteal tendinopathy um from my clinical experience and i think i read this in the research somewhere it's the actual activity modification that's mm -hmm. more important than the actual exercise so I've got a great exercise for uh, the gluteal tendinopathy. It's very simple. I share, share, share it now with people. Basically, you lie on your back with your knees up and you push out into, uh, into a, a adduction, sorry, abduction position isometrically. Mm -hmm. And you, the patient can just simply get a belt or something fixed. They don't need an exercise band. Pop it around the knees and then just do an isometric abduction action for mm -hmm. anywhere between 30 seconds to a minute now that's a brilliant exercise but if they don't do the activity modification if they if they don't stop hanging on the hip that's resting their weight on one hip and sticking the hip out if they don't stop sitting um, cross-legged if they sit in two lower chairs which can also be a culprit and if they keep irritating it at night as well then uh, it's unlikely that those things will work however if they just do the activity modification and don't do the exercise then they could still expect a good clinical outcome. And I think yeah. that's quite rare really in rehabilitation because often it is about the exercise and it is about yeah. doing the right thing in terms of loading. But for the gluteal tendinopathy, you can actually just uh, appropriately rest them and modify the positions they're in. And without actually doing any, any, any active exercise, that can help to settle down the symptoms considerably. Right. In clinic, though, I would always add in the exercise, but I do sometimes share with the patient that the activity modification is probably the most important part of mm -hmm. the plan rather than the, you know, diligently doing the exercise and not doing everything else. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. You find um, that uh, if, they've, uh, if they've come to you late on, so uh, say with the gluteal tendinopathy, this is usually the, the, uh, what I find, is uh, that they're often uh, misdiagnosed as a bursitis at the, at the GP. Um, and uh, uh, have, you, have you found that? Have you found that it's mm -hmm. a common kind of misdiagnosis? Yeah, I'm on the water tonight. I was on the wine, the wine last night. <laughs> but uh, run out of wine. Um, <laughs> so yeah, uh, that's a great question because um, I often find they come with a suspected osteoarthritis. Right. Not, not the bursitis. Uh, I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. It's also a good, good thing to discuss, but they come with, a, with a, an osteoarthritis mm -hmm. and you can imagine all of the, the kind of uh, negative connotations that come with either thinking you've got osteoarthritis or having an x-ray, which mm -hmm. shows uh, moderate, Typically, if I, you know, it would say something exactly like this, uh, moderate degenerative changes. Mm -hmm. Patient thinks arthritis, which yeah, is, yeah. which is not, not untrue, but actually it's, um, if you've got somebody who's say 60, 70, it's normal age related changes, you know, mm -hmm. their other, their other hip could be the same. Mm -hmm. If you can determine from differential diagnosis, and this comes from, um, the, the lady who mentioned about special tests earlier. Uh, if you can differentially diagnose between an osteoarthritic hip mm -hmm. and a uh, soft tissue tendon issue, then you, the patient's delighted because, you know, they don't want osteoarthritis of the hip. They know what that is. Their friend had it, hip replacements, blah, blah, mm -hmm. but They've got gluteal tendinopathy because they never understand <laughs> the, the, the other word, tendinopathy. Then they're delighted because it's it's soft tissue. It's not joint. They don't mm -hmm. need a joint replacement and there's they're even even more happy to hear that there's a, a very straightforward management plan that they can put in place, which I find from a clinical experience typically works within about two weeks mm -hmm. for a good 95 percent of my patients. Um, Brilliant. So yeah, quickly, not all not all patients, but, you know, pretty much all. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that that's the first one is to differentiate between the two. How do you differentiate? Well, um i think there's might be a video on the physio channel on how to do this but i can share mm -hmm. it with you now it's really about two things range of motion 
mm -hmm. and pain location. If it's an osteoarthritic hip, they're likely to have groin pain mm -hmm. um, as part of that feature. If it's gluteal tendinopathy or bursitis or something, the pain is uh, post, oh, the, the files have finally uploaded. Sorry guys, the files have finally <laughs> uploaded. So we'll get to those in a moment. Um, I say that, Mike, I don't know if they have. Uh, yeah, so we're saying range of motion and pain. So osteoarthritic hip is likely to be in the joint line in the front of the groin as well as other places. If it's a soft tissue, the tendon or the bursa, then it's posterior lateral. So it's mm -hmm. it's around the lateral side of the hip, around the back of the greater trochanter. Um, that's the kind of area where they're likely to get it. So if the pain is around there, then that indicates that it's more that soft tissue pathology. The other thing is range of motion. So here's a good question that you can ask if people are, um, want to know one question you can ask. And I shared this with one of the GPs recently. Very simple. Do they have problems putting on shoes and socks? Mm -hmm. If it's a gluteal tendinopathy, they should not because the joint is fine. Mm -hmm. If it's an arthritic hip, they probably will have problems because the joint restriction will will limit them at so if there's a limitation of flexion you can detect that by putting them on the couch and seeing how far the hip can flex but a quick question is do they have trouble putting on shoes and socks and if the answer is yes maybe it's the joint if the answer mm -hmm. is no it's likely it's soft tissue as well so that's like a a key question that i ask to differentiate between the two when you get them on the couch you can move the hip around if there's a restriction in flexion and a restriction in internal rotation Mm -hmm. then you've got a restricted joint there. Doesn't mean it's osteoarthritis, but it means that if you've got that coupled with the reported joint line pain, um, coupled with the limitation putting on shoes and socks, you can you can then start to see a you know a picture kind of yeah. join join the dots, if you will. And that's yeah. another thing with the sp special tests, uh, Mike, which you know, which you you'll know as well from um from clinic and obviously telling your students the same is that there's not really any special test that mm -hmm. that that tells you everything in one in one go. Yeah. Um you you perform a, a selection of tests and you get a select uh, you get a you get a, a whole batch of information and you then have to build a clinical picture um as to as to what's going on so yeah range of movement pain location they're kind of the key things for that no i'm really good um really the good. bursitis as well sorry to uh, go on the bursitis you mentioned it used to often be called um uh trochanteric bursitis mm -hmm. the, trochan the trochanteric bursa is the gluteus maximus bursa effectively and they did a very large study of a fair few like six seven hundred people i think and they found that in most people with the gluteal pain symptoms, the bursa was not implicated. Mm -hmm. So if you have, um, say, 100 odd patients with gluteal tendinopathy, uh, I think somewhere in the region of maybe 20 odd percent of them will have a, a, um, a bursa issue as well. Mm -hmm. But the other 80 percent won't do. So that's why the name change went from um uh the, the bursa to tendinopathy yeah. is because it was more like more definitely always the tendon and less much less frequently the the bursa as well but mm -hmm. it still goes by that name so if patients are told they have that or if gps use those terms then it's really uh clinically just kind of an interchangeable term really that um that's used yeah yeah so yeah Okay, um, Mike, I'm clicking on some buttons here. I'm trying to click on slides. Yeah. Um, but it, 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 oh, hang on. Preview. Aha. Right. Are we there? I, mean, I don't know. I mean, I can see a preview and I press start. Here we go. Yeah. Hey. Hey. There we are. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so this is what we were looking at last time, guys. Um, this screen here, I'd welcome you to have a look at the physio channel where you'll find lots of free information as well. So, we talked about the core concepts last time, and um, we had uh, we had a chat about uh, Achilles tendon ruptures as well. So, if there's any questions on Achilles tendon ruptures, um, please do ask. But we we did cover that last time, so uh, that's obviously yeah. We we had a good uh, if you if you didn't see that on the last one, we had a good uh, kind of um, online assessment test that you can do, so you can get uh, their partner or or themselves to squeeze the calf to see if the foot moves. Um, it's the um, uh, What's the name of the, the test? I can't remember the name of the test now. Um, Simmons or Tom Simmons, Thompson's. Or Thompson's test. Yeah. yeah, that's how I know it. Yeah, Thompson's test. So you can squeeze the calf and then the foot should move. So if the foot's not moving compared to the other side, then that's 
that should be quite quite clear on a on an online assessment if you do get called up by one of your clients with a potential uh, rupture of their Achilles tendon. So that was a that was a good little tip from last week. Then we talked through um, education. We talked through pain. We talked through education, and uh, we talked about how it's really important to educate the patient in terms of training load. And we we got up to uh, this point here where we were talking about load management and load tolerance. And actually, Mike, I want to ask you, you spoke about Tim Gabbett's work and I haven't yet, uh, I was going to get a lot of his papers and, and read them so I could kind of catch up with what you were talking about. But mm -hmm. you spoke about like the ceiling and the floor. Yep. Effect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I was thinking about something similar along those lines. Could you just briefly explain what you meant by that? Yeah. So um, he was talking about, uh, I mean, he, he mainly deals with athletes. And uh, so you'll, you'll have the ceiling, which is the, the ultimate goal. So it could be the Olympics or, um, you know, a, a specific game within the season or, or the, the beginning of the season. And uh, you're at you're at the floor at the in the preseason, and uh, the gap in between is obviously the the steps you need to take to uh, to get to where you need to go. So in his research, he found that um, the majority of um, injuries that were occurring were because uh, the the jump to get from that floor to the ceiling was too quick. So um, the and what he said was you need to raise the floor up in preseason so that the jump isn't so high. So basically, the players had to keep on playing in the off season so it wasn't such a big spike in their training load, getting them ready to play in the season. Um, and uh, yeah, he said so. He, he used the analogy as well that it, when you're um, when you're injured, you're not even at the floor; you're in the basement. So you've got to get to the floor before you can even get get to the ceiling um so that yeah it, it was quite a nice analogy that he used on it on his course and uh uh obviously you, you can kind of plan out your year you can plan out your uh your training schedule based on where, where you're at and where you want to go it's it's quite simple really it's it, kind of what what we've been doing for years anyway um but it was just a nice way to a nice way to frame it um mm. so that it's easy to understand yeah yeah absolutely so uh i think what that fits in with the, the training load and load tolerance for tendons as well because with tendinopathy how much stimulus do you need to uh, improve the tolerance of the tendon and of course the muscular components the contractile components attached to it and i think you you need really a, as much stimulus as you can get away with and how what is that well that's based on the person's tolerance Mm -hmm. Some people are going to be more tolerant of accelerating and, prog and progressing their training faster than others. That could be due to a variety of things such as training background, uh, you know, age, sport type, that sort of thing. If you don't provide enough stimulus, then either you will um, just be sort of plateau and nothing will happen, or you'll start to potentially have a detraining effect where, where, where you know, the, the capacity reduces. So it's really, again, I guess, about that floor to ceiling approach, but not from not the ceiling being where you want to get to, but the ceiling being the maximal amount of stimulus that you can provide before you start to nudge into uh, overtraining and before you start to nudge into tissue breakdown. Mm -hmm. So that to the point where it, you know it doesn't adapt and recover, but then below that you have a stim you know you have a, a stimulus which is basically too low or even detraining as well. Yeah. So it's about finding that that tolerance with the patient, and that can only be done by carefully monitoring mm -hmm. the response to the training load. And find, monitor. Um, sorry, yeah. mate. Do you find that patients are scared to push it um, and uh, what worried about? overloading and a bit too much and and potentially re-injuring re or or flaring it up making it worse yeah definitely in the early stages but because tendinopathy takes you know quite a while to get on top of uh and we start with those very basic isometrics where the where the fear of loading the fear of movement the kinesiophobia is very much reduced mm -hmm. then 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 i find there's plenty of time for them to start to feel more comfortable with the with the loading uh, as as things progress so um yeah I, I don't find that's too much of a problem it is something that needs to be tackled mm -hmm. but due to the amount of time it takes anyway there's time within the normal plan for them to adapt and for them to you know psychologically come around to the idea of of uh, of getting things loaded up uh have had a few failures of course i can think of a few patients that just simply haven't 
got their head around loading and, and have pretty much refused to to do any loading um, right. but but those patients are few and far between and with yeah. where, where i work uh it is a, a very one of the great things that i'm able to do um is is monitor those patients which i don't see again mm -hmm. so you know those patients who are dissatisfied with their treatment those patients that come to see um me and and, and they go off to see other people uh, I can because I'm working with the doctors I can follow them up three six twelve months later mm -hmm. and just see oh right they did this they did that they're back to square one or they got a resolve from that so um, that's a, a really interesting way of just seeing where where these patients go you know because yeah. I've always yeah. been fascinated by you know what, what happened to her or what you know did they eventually get this sorted and yeah it's very interesting to see that's to it. see that happen <laughs> in private practice we either did a very good job so they don't need to come back or we did a terrible job and they haven't come back so <laughs> we, don't, we don't never know yeah yeah, yeah. So it's good to, to follow up with them yeah. um and yeah so that's the training load and and load tolerance um and then this now what's this about that's a uh big explosion that's the um uh, the the nuclear bomb testing during the cold war this is relevant, Mike. I can see your face. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, this, let me introduce you to something called bomb blast research. When they did the nuclear bomb testing during the Cold War, it raised the levels of a certain type of uh, atmospheric carbon around the whole world. Any living tissues at that time would display those heightened carbon levels during that nuclear bomb testing. Now, because things are always metabolizing, like you see the palm trees on the beach there, because our bodies are always metabolizing, then once the atmospheric carbon levels reduce, the atmospheric carbon levels in our bodies and other living things would also reduce. Yeah. However, if something was developing during that time, and then it stopped developing or stopped metabolizing, then those increased carbon levels would be maintained. So there was a couple of studies where they found that people who were of a certain developmental age during this time had raised carbon levels in their tendons, which had not normalized due to more, um, you know, more normal carbon levels. Mm -hmm. Now, if the if they were alive during this uh, nuclear testing, um, the bomb pulse, they call it the bomb pulse. And this is not just people near where the bombs are going off. This is us in the UK as well and anywhere around the world. Then if they were alive at that time and their tendons were already, had already reached maturity, then there would be no change because the carbon levels would not have changed in the tissues because they're no longer metabolizing. Um, if they're alive during that time, but then they were still developing as the carbon levels normalized, then again, there'd be no change because they were still developing as carbon levels normalized. Mm -hmm. But they found, and they were able to determine two things from this. They were able to determine at what age do tendons potentially stop uh, forming and, and metabolizing, uh, to which case they found that it could be down as low as like 13, whereas they thought it was typically much older than that. Mm -hmm. But they also found that the tendon carbon levels were still high, which means that the tendon metabolism was really negligible because otherwise the carbon levels would have normalized the same as they had in neighboring bone tissue and the same as they had in neighboring soft tissue like contractile tissue, for example. Mm -hmm. So they found this. They also found that areas of tendon, op or sorry, they more than I think they postulated this rather than found it. They, 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 they made this assumption that areas of um, tendinopathy saw a higher metabolism um, and there was more going on in the tendinopathic zones than the non-tendinopathic zones. So there's a question really that's still out there is, can you get tendons to structurally adapt mm -hmm. when the bomb pulse research is showing that they're not changing, mm -hmm. yet, yet soft tissue strength and conditioning research shows that if you load a tendon significantly with a with a um, basically a strength training stimulus of low reps and high weight, that that can bring about some soft tissue changes in in the connective tissue, as well as the hypertrophy in the you know contractile tissue, for example. 
plus the tendinopathic part is still seems to be a bit more active and the metabolism is higher as well so there's there's sort of an unanswered question but there's there's information within that question to um to sort of attempt to to answer it so i was fascinated when i came across these couple of bomb pulse studies because it does link nuclear testing the cold war and tendinopathy <laughs> that's not a search string i've ever used to be honest <laughs> no, I know, but, but you know if ever tendon research gets boring i'd say this is <laughs> certainly an interesting study to to bring out hmm. uh, so yeah tendons are, are pretty um pretty static uh tissues and in kind of a state of stasis really so it's amazing that that we get these issues with them when they don't really change much and when when we successfully treat a patient what does that mean it means to me that the patient no longer feels any pain and they can go about running and doing what they want to do. But the structural changes in the tendon seem to be a very different thing compared to the pain changes that we're looking to make in clinic. Mm. And uh, yeah, the, you know, the, I'm, the, I'm not presenting an answer here. I'm just sort of presenting that the actual structure of the tendon seems to be quite a, uh, an in, inert um, tissue really. So yeah quite fascinating linking those two things together so uh, if we accelerate now to look at the research and this might be a good point to round off on a few let me see what year are we in 2020 2015 so around yeah okay so five years ago maybe a little before that um, isometrics became popular yeah isometrics for tendons and a lot of that came about from a study by Ebony Rio and colleagues that you can see in the screen there in the top corner. And this study was only done on six male volleyball players. They successfully reduced this, the, the pain in their patella tendons from doing some uh, 45 second isometric holds. And based on that research, suddenly everybody's doing isometrics for every tendon in the body. And you know and and that's not necessarily wrong but it is a huge extrapolation of a study done on a very specific group uh, male volleyball players and uh six of them so then some other researchers uh, uh seth o'neill and um uh, uh Hen henrik real uh they they looked at this research and they said hang on a minute are we getting a bit too carried away of isometrics here so um, O'Neill and his team looked at uh, the isometrics for the Achilles tendinopathy and um, Henrik Real and his team looked at isometrics for plantar fasciopathy and they basically didn't find such great results. It wasn't a case of yes this works. The results were very varied and they, they're really good in their studies. They presented the information in, in a really clear way so you could see the huge variance in the results now you could take an average and say the average suggested that the um, exercises did not lead to short-term pain relief and mm -hmm. that's what we're focusing on here is short-term pain relief we're not talking about uh, long-term rehabilitation success we're just saying can these exercises can these isometrics reduce pain in the short term they um yeah and they basically found that it, it didn't it didn't for achilles tendinopathy and it didn't for plantar fasciopathy but when you look at the research some people found it fabulously helpful mm -hmm. and others found it like a fabulous failure and there are some that found it a little bit helpful some that found it you know it didn't really help them much or they felt a bit worse but the results were very varied and that's certainly what i see in clinic um mm. uh, is that isometrics can work really well sometimes um, not so well and sometimes just make people feel worse in clinic i find personally that isometrics for achilles tendinopathy work better than they did in this study so for me i think they work better than they did in this study but i'm not seeing my patients in that kind of um study type of uh, yeah. environment so maybe if i lock them into that um that type of structure they they might report different results i do find that isometrics for plantar fasciopathy plantar fasciitis heel pain uh, i do find that they don't work very well for me in clinic and um, my results are probably a little bit worse than, than this study uh, suggested but that might just be the pathology as well so yeah there's no magic bullets the results are very varied it's not a case of throwing isometrics out of the bath and saying right that's it none of those uh because there is no you know magic alternative isometrics mm -hmm. make sense but they are unfortunately just not a, a panacea for all 
tendinopathy problems so yeah, yeah. what's your experience of using the mic do you get on with yeah it's so pretty similar really we um we do a bit of an achilles uh if it is an achilles issue we we do a bit of an achilles circuit and um uh we, we try to identify which uh which one of the exercises is having the most um most beneficial effect um but we'll do um we'll do a bit of a shotgun approach basically and set up stations where they'll go heavy isometrics They'll do a uh, an eccentric station and then a concentric eccentric as well. So we we kind of hit all three in the same session. Um, if I wanted to be scientific about it, then obviously I would just do one. But um, when time isn't on your side, um, we uh, we monitor the response in the session um to make sure that nothing's flaring it up actually whilst they're working out and obviously afterwards as well. Um, but so we know which ones are potentially flaring it up in the session but if it's sore afterwards then we we wouldn't know which ones so we'd have to adjust all of them but generally that seems to work really well um so uh mixing them up in that way and we we go really heavy as well we go mm. proper heavy um because uh uh I don't think people again that, that's why I asked that question before because I don't think people lift heavy enough on on some of these structures um to elicit a response mm. so uh, if they you know if you you can do um 30 40 repetitions then uh, that you're not going to elicit those changes but again it all depends on the person doesn't it so we've had um We've had a question here from Carol. Yeah, uh, I noticed. I noticed that. I thought that'd be a good time for for you to answer that because you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. Do, so, what we do is, um, we we would uh, we would work in a bit of a continuum. So, yes, we want strength training, but that that's down the line. So, if they're quite symptomatic, that's going to be out. Well, that is their main goal as well. They don't come to you because they want stronger. Um, uh, stronger calf muscles they, they come to you because their their Achilles is sore so that you want to reduce the symptoms initially get them on on board and then slowly start to build up those strength uh, changes o over time and I think Dan you mentioned that it, it's a good three month period before you will get those structural changes in the tissue so I think it's really important to be honest with your patients up front about that and say look this is a long haul thing. This is not just uh, this is not just going to be a quick fix. We may be able to um, alter the symptoms, modify the symptoms, and that might happen quite quickly. But the structural changes are going to take time, and you need to be with us for this time. And and I'm quite honest as well. And I said, look, I have no idea what your program is going to look like right now. We're going to have to monitor it on a session by session basis. I'll, we'll try something, see how you feel. If you respond really well, then we'll move down that route. If you don't, then we'll come back and we'll modify it. So it's um, it's a it's it, there's no uh, there's no recipe that I no. found anyway. It, it, every everyone's different. Carol said in her question there, uh, three to five rep max, mm -hmm. three to three to four sets. Uh, yeah, I'd say that's that's kind of bang on, really, mm, in yeah. terms of where to start with. What the research shows is that when you're looking for that structural adaptation, uh, that those low reps and heavy weight, low low sorry, low reps, heavy weight, slow movement, mm -hmm. that uh, those rep, those ranges are going to work. So Carol's, you know, definitely on to suggesting yeah. the right the right rep ranges there. Absolutely, and it, and it doesn't have to be heavy either, because uh, I mean, just a, a 20, 30 kilo could be heavy for someone. They may fatigue at, at five repetitions just with a, just even their body weight, maybe. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Mike. Yeah, so heavy is heavy is relative, isn't it? To yeah, yeah, the individual. Yeah, uh, what I would add to that, Carol, from a clinical perspective, is I might start them off with higher reps to begin with just mm -hmm. so they get used to the movement and get kind of in the swing of things because once you add once you add more weight to lower the reps they they might have a bit of uh, fear a bit mm -hmm. of kinesiophobia so i might start with just getting the technique up and running and then introduce the the weight as soon as possible because this is really comes down to efficiency maybe maybe higher reps will work but it's not very efficient it might just take a it might just take longer 
So by really nailing it down to, to heavy and slow and, and low reps, making sure there's good rest breaks in between of a couple of minutes, then you're, you're, you're creating the best and most efficient training stimulus. Because that's another thing, Mike, is if you tell someone it's going to take three months, mm -hmm. then that's fine. That's what the research shows. But you want to be as efficient as possible. They, they don't want to go away, you know, wasting their time doing too much or faffing around doing too many exercises willy nearly yeah. that's if they're going to do it they want to do it as efficiently as as possible so the five to the five repetition maximum range for strength and structural adaptation is the best way to make it efficient yep definitely yeah yeah so uh do we have another Question. Uh, yeah, Dan's asked the question, uh, how does metabolism of the tendons uh, relate to training load and exercise in children? Okay, brilliant. Is Dan one of those people that tried to come to Cornwall recently and they turned him away? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> turned him away at the M5 junction. <laughs> yeah, they've been tur turning people away. People with, people with massive caravans. I can see Dan having a massive caravan. Uh, hi, Dan. Um, so metabolism tendons children okay yeah so in children the metabolisms in the tendon are higher uh from that bomb blast research they found that tendon maturity might be reached as young as 13 but there was only a small number in that study so um the tendons do of course reach reach that uh, uh the maturity at some point where the metabolism slows down the tendinopathic part of the tendon which is only of course a small pocket of the tendon the metabolism within that zone seems to to fire up and increase one study suggesting it increases by 25 percent, but that's not the tendon that's just the little bit of the tendon the little pocket of, of tendinopathy uh children don't tend to suffer from tendinopathy proper tendinopathy so much they tend to suffer more from the enthesopathies the attachment points uh, which tend to be more where the growth plate is not quite um, firmed up so therefore they have these uh, apophysitis uh, issues such as Severs syndrome at the heel and of course um, Osgood Schlatter is the classic one or the other one is um, I love this word Sinding Jarsen Johansson syndrome <laughs> which is like Osgood Schlatter's but at the apex of patella and it'd be like a childhood version of patella tendinopathy but it's more the growth plate rather than the mm -hmm. uh, than the actual tendon so yeah um children and, and tendons it's more the attachment points there that are irritated uh, yeah so they just have to be carefully managed of course for uh whilst they sort themselves out whilst the condition heals because they're often self-limiting and they will settle as long as the patient the child doesn't keep uh, aggravating it unnecessarily mm -hmm. so yeah thanks dan brilliant all right great i think um yeah we've uh we've been um we've been chatting for just over yeah nearly 40 minutes so i think uh i think we'll call it a night um thanks very much again dan uh, Thank well, you, with Mike. Dan, dan and i had a chat uh just before we went live about um uh not just talking about tendons on this session but if you want to discuss anything else clinical um, and I think we had uh, we had something um, earlier about uh, special tests, uh, so we can certainly put together a, a session on that. Uh, we we envisage this uh, Monday night session to go on uh, post uh, COVID nineteen. So uh, yeah, if you want us to talk about anything, uh, if there's anything uh, that you're not sure about, um, then pop it in our Facebook group. So either on the um, the physio channel uh, or with uh, YouTube as well, uh, or Dan's page on Rock Tape or my one on Movement Therapy Education, and uh, yeah, just let let us know uh, anything that you want to discuss, and um, and we'll we'll have a chat again and and try and help you. Hey, okay, thanks again, Dan. Nice one, thanks, Mike. I'll Cheers, sign out Dan. now. Thanks, Take everyone. Care. Bye. Bye.